everyone. Um, as Kate said, I work in the area of statistical oncology. Um, so today what I want to do is just sort of provide an overview of what that actually is and hopefully uh, get a few of you interested in the area and hopefully uh, interested in working on this as part of your research. Um, so of course, you know, statistical ecology, it's sort of the interaction between statistics and ecology. Um, it's a growing interdisciplinary field and actually in the UK, there's now a national center for statistical ecology and you can actually look that up at ncse.org.uk. Right. But then what does that mean, statistics and ecology? Does that mean ecologists that take statistics courses? Um, does that mean statistics apply to any ecology data? Right. So a quick overview of some of the topics in statistical ecology. Um, we look at things like population dynamics, animal movement models, and this is actually an area that's um, quite of interest to me. Um, Metapopulation models, community models, distance sampling, etc. Um, and the focus of statistical ecology, of course, is statistical modeling. What models, what model formulations uh, make the most sense to this kind of data and the ecological questions that we'd like to answer? So, how do you get into statistical ecology? It's kind of a niche field so far. It's an interdisciplinary field, it's growing, but it's still quite niche. There's no statistical ecology program. So where I started personally, I started in statistics. And I have a slight shark obsession. I always love shark movements. I love the Discovery Channel. I love Shark Week. I love looking at their trajectories, seeing where they went. And I thought, there's data. That's, that's data. It's collected over time. It has interesting, interesting structure. That must mean that a statistician can analyze this type of data, right? Um, and so I just kind of found my way into statistical ecology because of my slight shark obsession but I have a, stat a statistics foundation and that's my background. And I made my way over to what's really called in statistics, ecological statistics. The question though is, how much ecology do you need to be an ecological statistician? I actually have no formal background in ecology, but sharks and marine animals are sort of just my hobby and I learned a lot about them. And that was sort of enough to get me started and start, uh, get the conversation starting. But what I'd certainly love for all of us to discuss later on is how much of each field do you really need to have or do you really need to know of? Most people actually in statistical ecology start in ecology or some type of uh, ecology, evolutionary biology. And the reason they get into what's from that end called statistical ecology is because they have really fascinating data sets. Right, you're looking at influences of climate change on these ecological systems. You're tracking animals for months or years. You're interested in interaction between tourism and like white sharks. You're interested in deforestation and how that affects biodiversity, right? So you have these amazing ecological questions that you want to answer. You have these amazing ecological data sets and you might need sophisticated modeling tools to actually answer that question and model that data. Right. So uh, what you might think of as sort of a quantitative ecologist, statistical ecology really focuses on not just quantitative methods, but specifically statistical methods to answer these types of questions. So we're looking at probabilistic models. Um, and a, a large part of the statistical ecology community comes from ecology. And then we have statistics that comes into play as well. And some people actually consider themselves both. Right. They are both statisticians and they're ecologists because they have a training in both. And while I'm not sure how much of this is um, already being done at University of Toronto, actually across Canada, there's quite a few professors and people that are jointly appointed just like me at different universities um, that are both in like the Institute for Oceans and Statistical Sciences, uh, biology and mathematics that are already doing this kind of interdisciplinary work. So does it matter if we call it ecological statistics or statistical ecology? Um, and regardless, what I love about it is that it's an interdisciplinary field. And what matters most is the communication between disciplines. So what's great about interdisciplinary fields is that it doesn't matter how much statistics I know, how much mathematics I know, if I can't communicate to an ecologist why it might, might, might be important and why it might be useful for their data analysis. For ecologists, it doesn't, you know, you have to have the proper domain expertise, but
but you also have to know some statistics to be able to communicate why that statistical model is a relevant modeling structure for your actual question that you want to answer. Okay. So I think um, what sometimes holds people back from going into these types of fields is statistics, statisticians that think they need to have a proper ecological background to, able to, to be able to do this work and ecologists who feel like they might not, they need to be statistics experts to be an eco, a statistical ecologist. And really you just need to be able to communicate. And I think that is actually the most important thing is that now I have uh, studied a bit more of ecology. I have a lot of colleagues that are ecologists and that I've learned enough about the systems and can actually communicate why my models might be relevant for what they're trying to do. And ecologists understanding enough statistics to understand why models might be important for, why certain models might be useful for their problem, right? But it's very much, I can't do this work on my own if I don't have collaborators that have the proper domain expertise, and I really find that fascinating. So examples of projects, here's actually a project that um, I would love to recruit a PhD student for, uh, the video on the right, is actually a conservation project where you uh, have cameras recording eagle nests. You're trying to detect whether the eagles are using it, how many eagles are there. Um, it's a more of a sort of machine learning statistical ecology project. But uh, some examples of projects, I have friends that estimate whale populations. And you get to hear amazing stories about people that go out on boats for two, three months at a time. They're counting whales, they're tagging blue whales out in the middle of the ocean. Um, there's also projects on how does sonar affect the behavioral response <clears throat> of certain marine mammals. Um, the Navy, for instance, invests quite a bit of money into understanding what types of effects are they going to have on whales and other marine mammals when they're doing their sonar testing on the middle of the ocean. I particularly like to look at when are sharks more active. Uh, and I get to hear amazing stories about shark scientists going out into the middle of the Pacific Ocean over by Galapagos Islands, tagging hammerhead sharks, uh, tracking down <laughs> accelerometers in the middle of the ocean um, and there's really fascinating data sets but questions like when are they more active where do they travel what do they do when they're there um, how do eagles behave around wind turbines right if we're thinking about sustainable energy and we're thinking about wind farms we have to also think about its interaction with the call with the ecological systems with interactions with how many eagles might die if you set up a wind farm in a certain location what do they need different winds for maybe a wind types of winds that are useful for uh, generation of wind energy might also be the types of winds that the eagles need to hunt, right? And that could be a problem. There's other things like modeling sea dispersal, animal abundance, capture, recapture, um, monitoring the critically endangered vaquita. So I don't know if any of you have heard about this. There's a certain porpoise that's near extinction in the Gulf of Mexico. And there's a lot of statistical ecologists who are working on this problem and working on this project, trying to estimate how many vaquita porpoises are actually left in the wild, um, modeling population dynamics, and much more. And so these are all, again, very much ecological questions. But when you look at the statistics and modeling behind them, it's actually quite sophisticated modeling techniques. Um, and so again, this is the area of statistical ecology where we think about why are these, what models do we need to answer these statistical, these eco ecological questions? And also, when we create these very complex statistical models, why are they useful and why should we use these complex statistical models, right? Um, and so I find it extremely interesting. I find the data that we collect, they collect really interesting. Um, and it's a lot of fun for me as a statistician, right? I don't get to just sit in front of a whiteboard. Now I get to talk about sharks and whales and things like that. Um, again, sorry, a slight shark obsession. I'm actually a part of the American Alaska Brink Society, and I've been part of a member now for, I think, five or six years. Um, so I actually am a bit involved in the shark science community. And these are pictures of all the different sharks and um, data that I've modeled. And I have current and ongoing projects um, with shark accelerometer data, shark GPS data, acoustic data, a lot of sensor data from sharks. Um, so what you don't usually think of is I, a statistician, getting a PhD in Iowa, in the middle of the US, um, would now get to do shark statistics, right? But it's the fun of being a statistician and being able to collaborate. So the general class of models that I typically work on the most are actually called hidden Markov models. 
And if you're going to be doing statistical ecology, you definitely need to know what a Hindemark model is. Um, it is certainly my bias to saying this is the fun in statistical ecology, but it's actually quite useful for a lot of different areas. Um, for animal movement in particular, the reason we use hidden Markov models is because the mathematical structure sort of implies this image, this graph we see here. We have some observed movements of animal movement, whether it's the trajectories of positions of the animals across time. It can also be the accelerometers, so we can have 3D uh, acceleration of their movement. Um, and the idea is that what we observe is actually a proxy for, we can use it to infer their underlying unobserved behavioral state. So what we really care about is animal behavior. We want to know, are they resting? Are they more active? What types of foods do they go to eat at? Um, how do they use the landscape? Um, and a slew of other questions. Right? Um, for example, one of, the question, one of the research projects that I'm currently working on is on oceanic white tip sharks. Um, and I don't really know where the cursor is, if you can see it, I can't. But we have, this is a, a L, the ODBA, ODBA, is overall dynamic body acceleration. And it's sort of a summary statistic of how much energy, um, how much energy these sharks are uh, expending. So we have, if you can see in the sort of time series where it's sort of green, um, you have peaks where they're much higher. You have the blue that's kind of middle and you have these sort of lower uh, yellow areas. And that's actually what we we're able to do with the hidden Markov model. What you're able to do is you're able to connect observations with different, what we call states. Um, and you can see above here, there's a histogram of the ODBA. You can see different peaks or have our estimates of the distributions of what we call the states. And so we're sort of doing like a clustering, a clustering over time of the different patterns that we observe. And so here, the pattern that we observe are really just higher values of ODBA. We have these middle values, and then we have these lower values. Um, and what they actually connected with when we looked at the energy expenditure is actually their diving patterns. Because sharks are negatively buoyant, when they dive down, they don't have to expend energy, they just sink. And so that's actually the yellow bits right there. The blue is when they're sort of coasting and the green peaks are actually when they decided to ascend. And they expend different amounts of energy when they ascend, right? So with the hidden Markov model, what you're able to do is you're able to apply this model to this type of data. You're able to create different groups of possibly relevant biological um, states and then you're able you're able to include covariates like when do they dive more, right? When are they doing the sort of yellow and green bits a bit more? Do they dive more in the middle of the day? Is that how they, what they do to forage? Um, or do they expend more energy when they're, if they accelerate, right? So you're trying to get an, an idea of what does the shark actually do? Um, and a lot of the analysis that we do now as well are sometimes a bit exploratory because they're, you can attach sensors now to sharks, all types of sensors. And this is the first time that you can get this really fine scale data, right? And now the task that I have along with my collaborators is how do we make sense of what they actually do? Can we describe these different behaviors? Can we just gain some knowledge of what they're actually doing out in the middle of the ocean? Um, so like I said, for, uh, I work on hidden market models quite a bit. Um, for animal movement, it's sort of identification of ecologically important underlying behavioral states. Um, I work on sort of model specification and construction, and you can do a lot of other fancy techniques and statistics. You can use what's called penalized splines. You can use other flexible frameworks to capture different dynamics. So mathematically, it's actually a really, really fun framework to work with because you can extend it in a lot of different ways. And then for other ecological data, um, this isn't necessarily, you can maybe think it's a bit more environmental than ecological, but I'm also working on, you can use these models to do forecasting for uh, wind speed. Um, there's some challenges with hidden Markov models, which I won't really get into here, but just if anyone is actually interested in this, um, there's sort of this model misclassification uh, in statistics, statistics what we call identifiability issues, is how much data do you actually need to estimate the model? There's some computational challenges that are actually a lot of fun. Um, so I'll get into a little bit, just one area of research that I'm kind of pursuing here, uh, I'd like to pursue in the next few years. Um, and it's actually centered around merino sheep. 
So this is a photo that I took when I did a research visit in Argentina. And again, the, the benefits of being a statistical ecologist is that you get to travel to where the systems are. So I got to travel to Argentina, do a research visit there and hang out with these sheep for a few weeks. So I was asked a very simple question. Um, as all I call, as my collaborators like to ask me very simple questions that are very hard to answer. And it was, how does body condition affect their movements? Right, so you can do an analysis of their movement. You can try to identify different behaviors, uh, look at if they have daily patterns and how they move around. Do they sleep at night? Do they travel during the mornings? Do they eat during the mornings? What do they do? But then physiologically, how does their body condition affect their movements? So this graphical structure is now a little extended from what we saw before. But part of my research is to build a model that includes body condition as a covariate for the behavioral, to incorporate in the behavioral state searching process of an animal movement model for merino sheep. So what that means is that it's kind of like if we think about ourselves, if we are in very good condition, if we've been training for a marathon, for instance, then we might be able to actually run the marathon and do this in a good time. If we are not training for a marathon, we might not be able to actually run it, right? We might physiologically, our body condition might be, might not be suited to doing those types of tasks. And it's the same thing for the sheep, right? If they're in good condition, does that mean that they can actually evade predators? Does that mean that they can travel a bit further to find the really good food? Um, does that mean usually body condition for merino sheep is that they will, they'll be able to survive the winter, they'll be able to reproduce. And that's important for farmers in Argentina to understand that. Um, and here, what we end up doing is combining probabilistic models of animal movement, like hidden market models, and incorporating um, the physiological dynamics of this sheep in particular. Um, what we're looking at specifically is body fat percentage. And what we have to get into then is energy levels. Um, for instance, it increases according to foraging intake, right? When we eat, we gain energy. Uh, it decreases due to locomotion costs and daily maintenance. It then uh, transfers into what we call the energy balance, right? How much you eat increases your energy balance, subtracting the locomotion cost, how much you move around, and then subtracting the daily expenditure. Um, just how much, if you didn't move at all during the day, how much energy would you burn? That then goes into uh, creation of lean muscle mass, body fat evolution, and then you construct a body fat percentage. So the covariate that we're actually uh, for, we're using for condition is body fat percentage of these merino sheep. Um, and what we, what I probably won't get into is sometimes you observe this. The problem with the condition is that you can't uh, collect it with a sensor. You have to go and record it um, manually. So they actually only have condition once every month. Um, and we actually try to predict body condition between the, the two, uh, predicted on a daily scale. So each day we have a new body condition to incorporate as a covariate into the movements of the, the merino sheep for that day. Um, but what this goes to, and what I'm actually really interested in pursuing here at U University of Toronto, is construction of generative models of animal mov movement. So models that can simulate realistic trajectories of animal movement, which means it incorporates their physiological capacity to actually move a certain way the changes in their hunger and fatigue. So if a sheep is hungry, what is it going to do? Try to incorporate routes and dynamics that minimize predator interactions. There's actually a sheepdog in Argentina, so we'd have to include sort of, if there's a sheepdog, if there's not a sheepdog, what risk are the sheep willing to take? Um, and for a marine mammals, this is a conversation that I had now six years ago, regulated, regulating the time underwater, right? So when you're modeling, um, whale dives, for instance, they might not be able to do the same type of dive 50 times in a row. At some point, they have to come up to breathe. They can only spend a certain amount of time underwater. Um, and currently, those physiological dynamics are not necessarily incorporated into statistical models of animal movement. Um, and it's a great interdisciplinary avenue. Uh, it's very challenging, but it can be, I think, from both the ecology side and the statistics side, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and more broadly, something that I'll probably talk about in my own work for the next 10 to 15 years is that when you model, when you assess a model from a statistical standpoint, it does not mean that it can produce biologically realistic data. Um, and that's something that I'm quite interested in chatting with school environment students as I teach and pursue research over the next few years. And 
this idea of generative models of animal movement, uh, a lot of it is based on conversations with Dr. Juan Manuel Morales, who is the researcher in Argentina. So statistical ecology at University of Toronto. I don't think there's a few uh, faculty here who do this type of work. Um, I think I'm the only one in statistical sciences, but I'm sure there's others that are probably interested in this area. And I think it's a really perfect fit at the University of Toronto as a joint effort between statistical sciences, ecology and evolutionary biology, and the School of the Environment. And what I think the School of the Environment in particular brings is another area, a general area of interdisciplinary research, um, because uh, like as Kate coming from political science, the ecology work that we do is not apolitical. It could like the um, modeling of the vaquita porpoise. So the, the numbers are actually um, going down quite a bit because of uh, illegal fishing in the Gulf of Mexico. So right, so how do you regulate that? And that has to do with the politics of uh, fishing in Gulf of Mexico and a lot of other areas. But I think there's an opportunity for us to grow uh, statistical ecology. Um, I can't see the chat. I don't know if someone's, I'm sorry. Political ecological statistics, exactly. That would be amazing. Um, so yeah, so I, I really want to train a generation of statistical ecologists and ecological statisticians at the University of Toronto. Um, there's actually efforts underway to form a group in Canada, actually, as we're speaking right now. Um, and I think this is kind of, uh, in the UK, there's already a National Centre for Statistical Ecology, and we should be able to do this in Canada. And I think what we actually can do in Canada even more so is Statistical ecology is all based on domain expertise of ecological systems, right? We construct our models based on these domain, this domain expertise. We want to answer specific ecological questions. And there's a really big opportunity to incorporate domain expertise from indigenous knowledge, right? Statistical models that are formulated around indigenous knowledge and indigenous domain expertise of ecological systems. Um, it's not something that actually is being done. I don't know why, but I feel like in Canada, we have this opportunity to really become much more interdisciplinary, even within statistical ecology. So this is just a brief overview of what statistical ecology is. Um, the only real group of statistical ecology so far at the conference is called the International Statistical Ecology Conference. It happens every two years, and next time it'll be in 2022 in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, there's quite a few people that are across Canada that already do this type of work, things like with killer whales, accelerometer data, GPS data, diving patterns, et cetera. Um, if this is of any interest to you, do feel free to contact me. Um, I'll be looking for grad students over the next few years. And yeah, thank you so much for coming. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for that wide ranging talk with really vivid examples. Um, we will send everyone to breakout rooms so we'll send you there for about five minutes to formulate your questions. As a reminder, please write them in the chat in your discussion group or share them with your graduate student facilitator by voice. And then we'll see you back in the main room after those sessions. Oh, so you go to a lake. Oh. Hello. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Do we have to go to another lake to do this or just stay here? I don't know. Actually, I, partic I just joined a couple of minutes before oh. you know, because there was a technical issue. I uh, I could not able to part join, so I'm gonna figure out how this works. Hi, hi there. Um, so we're Hi. just in a small group right now, just to have a little discussion about oh, it. There might okay. be a grad student. I'm also a grad student in the program. Okay. 
there looks. But do we click on that link that showed up on the? I don't. I don't think the breakout rooms worked out. Um, quite well. It how didn't work out. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me. Uh, maybe Too many people in this. Um, um, is there a moderator yeah. for Kate? This? I don't know. Hi, Kate. I have. I think I have a. Let's uh, close the room. Okay, let's close the room. Is there a moderator here for our group? I'm not sure whether they it automatically. I don't think so. I think then someone can write uh, the points and maybe we have we, we need to just uh, describe what we uh, we need to uh, maybe we need to say what we discussed in our breakout room, maybe. So so no, not yet. We're actually just gonna have the. Uh, Pavel, I think those were maybe a little bit short. I don't know what's, I, I opened all the uh, all the rooms and they should have gone there automatically. Oh, okay, so then maybe we're and we on. did. So oh, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I know. But it okay, shows sorry, that nobody sorry, joined the rooms. We've, no, we've had a little bit of a technological glitch here. Let's see if we can try this again. Yeah, there were a lot of everyone the whole time. Okay, let's um, let's try this again, everyone. If you can just hold tight, we have enough time that, that we can sort this out and give you the chance uh, to do that. Uh, so yeah, if you can just just hold tight, and we'll uh, we'll see. So the rooms are. Uh... I'm not sure whether it's my uh, uh, access because Jessica has all the credentials. Although I'm a host, I don't know. I opened all okay. the rooms. I see. That's okay. Pavel, let's, let's not worry. Why don't we do this a little bit differently then? Uh, why don't we have um, audience members take a few minutes in this big group and we won't invite you to do this by voice. We'll just ask that you write questions in the chat box. So we'll just let everyone stay in this big room. Uh, our graduate students who were kindly going to facilitate, we'll just uh, have you add your own questions if you have any um, in writing, but we'll just ask that you use the chat box um, and, and write down your questions, but we'll, we'll take that same five minutes. So we'll just give everyone a chance. And if you need to take a quick break, uh, we'll start again with a question and answer session uh, moderated by me with whatever questions come into the chat boxes as well as my own. So five minutes, put your questions in the in the in writing in the chat box and, and we'll we'll bring it in. Technology is always uh, a little bit of a, a new experience here uh, in our virtual worlds of, of online yeah. seminars. But I'll ask everyone to keep your microphones off. Uh, just so that we keep the, the level of noise down uh, and, and we'll just try it all by writing. Thanks everyone for your patience. Uh, shall I stop recording, Kate? Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Let's just put the recordings on pause. Uh, we can pick it up again when uh, when I pick up in multiple ways, uh, which are about how do you, beyond the application to policy and these kinds of questions, how do you think about science communication when most of your audiences, including sometimes the ecologists you're working with, are not statistical experts? So how do you think about using things like data visualization, uh, very forms of narrative explanation in communicating your work? And relatedly, what have been some of the biggest challenges in your interdisciplinary collaboration? So you bring up the importance of communication. Where have you seen the, the largest barriers come? Yeah, so um, 
I'll start off by, I guess, providing an example. Um, Dr. Chris Lowe, and I can put it in the chat. He runs the Shark Lab at the California State University, um, Long Beach in California, of course. Um, and a lot of his work is actually like they'll have booths out on the beaches and they call it the shark lab booth and they talk about presences presence of sharks on the california coast uh shark aggregations white sharks why uh, the baby sharks need locations why they need you know might be the nicest beaches but the sharks need to uh, actually aggregate there baby sharks need the protection uh, they might be able to eat really good food there um, and so he does a lot of work in trying to communicate, you know, the importance of sharks in the ecosystems, um, why it's a good thing that we see a lot of baby sharks off California. And he uh, actually has a project that he's working on now of trying to predict where the sharks will aggregate in order for the different tourism <laughs> companies or uh, the different cities to allocate different tourism fundings, depending on whether the sharks are going to be at their beach or not. Um, how long they're going to be there. You know, you can't have a lot of events and spend a lot of money on beach events if they're going to be there for three weeks, two months, I mean, regardless of COVID or not. Um, I think I, I'll leave the science communication part to the people that actually do science communication because I feel like it's really its own area. <laughs> and I will not pretend to be someone who does science communication formally. Um, and what I, what I try to do enough of is just be able to communicate my findings to my collaborators. Um, and they can sort of say, well, does this mean this? And I'll say yes or no, or actually, well, it's, it's a bit more nuanced. Um, but science communication, I think rightly is kind of its own field and there are people who are really experts in it. Um, and I can only really, I just, I just want to be good enough to, collab to collaborate with the ecologist and to be able to describe the model to them. Um, and the hardest part is the communication part <laughs> because usually in, when you're collaborating as a statistician, what people want to know is, well, is this important or not? Is this significant? Is this effect significant or not? Um, and it's never just a yes or no question. It's very, there's a lot of grace <laughs> and there's a lot of uncertainty. And I think what's really hard is to make decisions under uncertainty. Right, so do you decide, um, what do you decide to do in order to control certain population dynamics? What decisions can you make to, uh, so that the vaquita porpoise won't go extinct, right? So I think the hardest thing is for statisticians is to communicate the uncertainty around what our model actually finds. And what's hard for the ecologists that I collaborate with biologists is to make decisions under uncertainty when it's not a yes or no. Um, and working with them, uh, again, working with people who are not statistical or not very mathematical, it's trying to figure out how do we communicate with each other and how do we make those decisions? And I'm working on it. I think simulating from your fitted models to try to figure out here are the different scenarios that are possible. We fit, it on, we fit our model and here's what it's implying about our system. How many of these scenarios are bad? <laughs> Are, are any of the scenarios things that we really don't want to happen? Or all, all possible scenarios somewhat okay? And if any of those things happen, that's actually okay. Um, but simulation-based uh, tools for assessing how realistic your model is. Um, I don't think we, know, we do enough simulation in statistics. That's it's interesting. Some of the questions that have come up since you started answering this question are, are answered, I think, in part by, by what you've just shared with us. So this idea of just how do you think about um, scenario building to understand the success likelihood of various treatments. And, and I think you've, you've shared that really well. Switching gears and thinking about the work that is done to gather the data that you're collecting. I've had a number of questions come up, and I'm, I'm also very curious about um, what you make of how you address in your models the concern that the data collection strategies will change the behavior of the species that you're studying. So you've talked about uh, putting tags on various species, you've talked about camera uh, kind of work, various strategies for gathering those data. When you're translating that kind of ecologically based data gathered by certain potentially invasive 
interactions with animals, uh, how do you understand whether you're, you're getting data that actually does mean something biologically? How do you, do you, can you do that in your statistical work? Is that only something that can be addressed by the ecologist? How do you grapple with that? Yeah, so the, that's, that's really where the domain expertise comes into play. Um, because even if I don't catch it when I'm doing an analysis, the rest of the people in the field will catch it. Um, and so domain expertise and why you collected the data in certain ways. But also, even if you do have very strong artifacts and you have very strong um, biases in your sampling design, I think you can analyze the data with that in mind. <laughs> it's just a limitation, right? So it's how you interpret what your actually findings mean. Um, I love being open about biases in every aspect of the work we do, in the statistical modeling we do, in how we collect data. There's a whole bunch of subjectivity, and I think there's subjectivity and biases in everything we do. Um, we can't really think of things as sort of unbiased. It's just this is what this, you know, it's, it's unbiased, it's the data we collected. You know, there's limitations in terms of how much uh, money you can spend to buy sensors. There's the heartbreaking um, stories of, for instance, a PhD student in Mexico. She tagged 10, species, 10 fish that are endemic to the Gulf of Mexico, no, to the Gulf of California, sorry. That, oh, Baja California. Um, they are illegally fished all the time. So out of 10, she recovered two tags. What do you do then? <laughs> um, so there's a lot of these types of stories of, there's just limitations in everything you do. Um, and I put in the chat, uh, bios-logging.net. So it's actually an international biologging society that talks about tagging animals, all these things. Uh, there's also MoveBank, which has some data repositories, some open data sets. I think there's a fun baboon data set where you have like multiple animals so you can see where they're moving around. Um, so there's a lot of limitations. Unfortunately, that's not necessarily my area of expertise. And I think it's also good that I admit that this is not my area, right? I'm a statistician. Um, so, but I get to chat with a lot of people that do talk about this all the time. Uh, and it's a really important aspect of, of this, of the work that we do in animal movement. Yeah, so the, the example you bring up of, of the number of sensors lost and the ways in which a small sample population became even smaller, maybe statistically impossible to analyze. There were a couple of questions that came in about how you address the often necessarily small sample sizes that you have when doing ecological work with animal movement, uh, and then trying to fit this into statistical models that gain uh, reliability, statistical power when the sample sizes get larger. So how do you think about the statistical tools you're using with often very small sample sizes? Yeah, so we've published um, some papers where we have like four sharks of one species. Um, and so I think there's a balance, right? Where when you analyze four sharks from one species, you're not going to say, here's what the population of sharks at this location does. Um, but when you don't know anything about the sharks at all, and this is the first data that you've collected, uh, there's some, sometimes there's a tendency to just be descriptive. Uh, well, I saw these spikes in this movement. They were here at this time. So sometimes what you, all you can really do is some type of exploratory modeling. Um, and maybe that's providing some new insight that you hadn't thought of. Maybe that can motivate uh, a larger study so you can apply for more money. You can say, well, we're actually looking at, looking at this data with some exploratory modeling. We found that these sharks, even though there's only four sharks, they all tended to be really active during the present when there was these animals present or during this time of day, we really need more money to do this. Um, so again, it's, it's the limitations. Tagging sharks is hard. Um, finding these sharks out in the ocean is hard. And usually they only have a small time window, a uh, time frame where they have to go out. Sometimes it takes them 24 hours in a boat uh, just to get to where they need to go to find the sharks. They can be out there for a week. They can tag sharks. They need, a, um, usually when the, when the sensor comes off, they have, I think, I can't remember if it's 12 hours until the battery is going to die and they won't be able to, so it'll ping a location and they have to get on the boat and go find it. Right, so it's, there's so much effort involved 
in gathering this data and it's really hard to gather um, that yes it's four but you're not then going to be you just need to try to find something that's makes sense of what you actually can observe um, and yes it might not generalize and yes it might not be the most robust thing in the world um, so this is this is where the interpretations come into play as well right um, and what what can you feasibly do? Why should you collect data on four sharks? <laughs> um, but otherwise, it's it's so tagging can be really hard, especially for the for marine mammals and and marine animals. So it's this is certainly a question that my collaborators can can discuss more. Um, I just usually have fun with the shark data sets I get. Yeah, I appreciate the idea of thinking about some of this work as exploratory. How do we think about beginning to model systems that we know very little about and whether or not these tools are, are the right ones, they might point us in new directions. That's a, a way of thinking about small samples and, and model error that I hadn't really considered. Um, moving to a slightly different angle on this. So a lot of your work has been on uh, animal movements, animal behavior, but you also mentioned um, a project on wind speed forecasting. And that led to a couple of questions on uh, the role of these kinds of models in sort of non-biological processes, things that are, are physical or um, other aspects of, of the uh, scientific realm. Um, what other kinds of ecological data uh, or environmental data are these models relevant to? Are you interested in um, whether that's Climatic, whether it's things at continent scales, could you say a little bit more about kind of statistical ecology or statistical environmental science uh, kind of scaled up? Yeah, so this is probably more on environmental statistics. Um, for some reason, there's this sort of divide between statistical ecology and environmental statistics. Um, the Markov switching and hidden Markov model and Markov switching processes are really that you have some observations that change over time in a way that you have, you can actually put some type of meaning behind the observations that you have. So um, they're actually used quite a bit in economics. Um, so when markets are stable or not stable, so like there, if there's a stable market, you might not see very much change in the price. And when it's unstable, you're gonna have a lot more fluctuations around the prices or whatever, however the system is um, behaving. Um, you can think of like uh, been thinking a lot more between the Canadian dollar and US dollar exchange, right? So when it's pretty flat, so it's 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 pretty consistent, and then other times you might be changing quite a bit. Um, the introducing a new product into the market might create some instability. Um, and for wind speeds, I've kind of just been thinking of there's times when there's really high wind speeds uh, because of whatever's occurring. Um, and so you have maybe some days have periods of sort of relative speeds that are good for generation of wind energy. Then you have some days that are, speeds are a lot higher. And if it crosses a certain threshold, they actually have to turn off the wind turbines because it can cause, it can cause damage to the wind turbines. Um, and so modeling those changes over time where you have sort of these higher wind speeds, low wind speeds, middle wind speeds. Um, but really it's just when you have, um, you can assign sort of meaning to different patterns that you observe in the data over time. And that's really what hidden Markov models are to begin with. It's just you have different patterns that you're interested in capturing. There's some persistence over time and over the space. Um, and you can model how long that event occurs. And then once that event finishes, what's likely to happen? So when an animal is done eating, is it likely to then sleep? Or is it likely to continue traveling? Or what is it going to do afterward? So they're really flexible. I really love working with them. That's, that's really helpful. And maybe I, I wonder if you could expand uh, a little bit on, it, it sounds like the, the role of sort of animal tracking mechanisms and these larger GIS tools for, for things like wind speeds um, could lead you to use similar models, at least kind of the structure of the models. And I wonder, we had some questions come in about things like incorporating spatial statistics into ecology, the use of GIS uh, data in your work. Um, for those of us who are a little bit newer to statistical modeling, uh, maybe you could say a bit more about those intersections and whether, sort of whether and how they're different. Yeah, um, 
So I'm actually a bit new to spatial statistics as well. <laughs> um, although I'll be teaching a class next semester on this topic. Um, yeah, so you can have uh, Markov switching models for spatial data, right? So if your system, um, we know if, if, if you want to model, what might your system model? Trying to, come up, trying to think of these, these examples off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, you can think of even just the, the, the winter times and the, um, what time of the year are the leaves, are the trees going to start losing their leaves? Um, and you can think of modeling a forest and having different sensors and different recordings across the forest and looking at their changes over time. Um, but I, it's, I'm still a bit new to spatial modeling, so I don't actually have as much information <laughs> aside from this, this wind turbine. Uh, I have a lot of people that I know that do spatial modeling. Um, and next semester, we're going to get into uh, sloths, some spatial data set for sloths in Central America. Um, I'm actually going to do some spatial modeling for animal movement. So I have a grid cell of a certain area where these leopard sharks aggregate off the coast of California. And we're going to think about it as a spatial field. And then we're going to model the changes across that spatial field, which is really animals, the number of leopard sharks. Um, so I don't actually have a great answer. Um, but it'll be a lot of fun next semester to come up with fun examples and maybe think of Markov switching models in that context as well. Oh, well, thanks for sharing your thoughts on kind of a new area of your work. I think this is one of the neat things about the seminar series is you can both share work that you have have done and that, that has already been uh, published, but also this new work in progress, these areas where uh, statistical work is beginning to be applied in new ways or where you're coming into a field you know, in a new way. Um, one of the questions uh, that, that I have for you is, do you see there being any risk of relying on statistical models in these kinds of studies? So, you know, we've seen and heard a lot of the benefits of using statistical modeling uh, for understanding these patterns of behavior, patterns of movement, underlying states. Uh, are there cautions that you offer when you're working with collaborators? Um, are there cautions that you would give to students who are enthusiastic about uh, statistical approaches to some of these conservation questions or, or ecological questions? Um, where, where do you see some of the cautionary notes? Um, right. So this is why I say domain expertise is, is important and defining your scientific question and your narrative is really important at the beginning. Um, when I am approached to collaborate on a project, especially by uh, graduate students, um, my first question is, okay, what, well, what is the scientific question behind what you're actually doing? Right. So we don't start with the models. We start with, we take many steps back and it actually might take us four or five meetings before you even touch a model because I have to ask them, well, what is your scientific question? What are you actually doing? Or, like, what would you actually like to know? And a lot of students are really good at saying, well, I want to understand how climate change is going to affect shark behavior in Long Beach, California, for instance. And it's like, oh, okay, that's a great question. Well, how do you actually answer that question? How do you quantify that? What do you measure? What can you measure and what can't you measure? How can you, how, once you quantify something like behavior, what does it actually mean for shark behavior? Does it mean changes in their, what types of movements? What types of signals are we looking for? Um, and so you have to first, I think, really take a step back and answer these questions very well and have a really good understanding of what are you actually trying to say? What are you trying to answer? What are the limitations behind what you, the data you have? Be open about that. And then you'll find that the statistics that you do will fit into the narrative that you can actually tell. Right. Instead of saying I apply the statistical model and now I'm not doing anything, I apply the statistical model, look at all these significant things and it's unbiased and it's telling me that these are important. Right. You need some understanding of what you're actually doing, why you're implementing certain models, what are the limitations of the models, what are the limitations of the data, how can you actually interpret the, re the results and then you know, you will find that statistics can answer some questions, it can answer other questions, and you can only answer some things partially. Um, so really, I think that the entire narrative is really important. And it's not just that 
a statistical model or machine learning algorithm is magical because it's never magical. It's always, uh, <laughs> this is <laughs> a slide that I usually have in other talks that I give is that this is not magic, right? We should implement these models and algorithms with a purpose because we have a slight, we have an understanding of how that data, the data um, and the model or algorithm, it fits into the narrative we're trying to tell. I mean, you can do some exploratory modeling as well and say, well, I'm not actually sure um, and sort of dwell on that a little bit, but it shouldn't always be just that the model says. Fabulous. Uh, I think it's, it's crucial to think about those underlying questions motivating the work and that maybe is a, a shared concern at the School of the Environment uh, from all of our different disciplinary angles. What methods do we use to answer the questions, but what are the questions? Um, one of the one of the kind of broader projects you have beyond your your own specific research is fostering this community of statistical ecologists, ecological statisticians uh, mm -hmm. in Canada, um, more globally as well. But uh, could you say something about you know how you might encourage someone to pursue a path into this if they're already in one of these fields or if they're thinking about joining these fields? How do you think about fostering the kind of community that you envision across universities um, when people are studying and collaborating on such different species, on such different questions, uh, where are these shared areas of, of overlapping community? Yeah, so I think the, the, the reason that a community, community like the statistical ecology community is so great is that people, like you said, are studying all different types of systems. They study sometimes ant movements in an ant farm. Right, but we might use the same models on sharks and ants. <laughs> and the difference is then we incorporate domain expertise. How do you interpret the model applied to ant data versus shark data versus whale data? Um, and the statistical foundations and the narratives of these models that are commonly used uh, can then be adapted and interpreted across the different systems. Um, so they're in EEB. Uh, there's a professor, I will not say her name correctly, uh, Marie Jose Fortin. Uh, she is a statistical ecologist and basically a statistician as well. And she's a professor in EEB. Uh, there's another professor in EEB that I can't think of right now. Um, but so we're actually coming together now. And if you're actually interested in being part of the statistical ecology community in Canada, send me an email and I'll get you on the list that we're just creating right now. Uh, we're going to have a meeting. It's people from UBC for all the way to Dalhousie, so across all of Canada. Um, there are people that work on these types of ecological questions, but we all sort of use this, sometimes we all use the same statistical models, right? So then how is a statistical model that, like a hidden Markov model, that's also used in activity recognition and speech recognition, why is it relevant for sharks? <laughs> why is it relevant for ants? Why is it relevant for killer whales? Uh, what, what are the differences? How do we adapt these models? Um, and to foster the community, I think we're, across Canada, we're just starting. This is sort of something that's just getting started. Um, and across U of T, I think the, those of us that are becoming part of this group that are already at U of T, we can start to start the conversations. Um, this is just my first year. I've been here now for a few months. Um, so I'm mostly just trying to get settled in and hopefully next year we can start like a real conversation about statistical ecology and like someone said, you know, political statistics, political ecological statistics, right? So incorporating um, politics, political science as domain expertise into our statistical models. Fabulous. So I guess the, the kind of stay tuned for the developments to come as well as join in if you're interested. Yeah. Um, for those to remind our, our listeners who are not uh, who are not as familiar, EEB is of course uh, ecology and evolutionary biology. For most of you, that's that's familiar. For some of you, it might not be. Um, to to sort of wrap things up, since we've had this this vibrant, wide ranging conversation, uh, you answered briefly in the chat, but I think there are probably many people who are keen to know a little bit more. Why is your favorite shark? The Greenland shark. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about this wonderful species that has captured you amidst all of the sharks that you love so much. 
So the Greenland shark is actually a uh, Canadian. So I'm really happy to have uh, gotten a job in Canada. Um, I guess so I was, um, I was born in Mexico, grew up in the US and I just keep making my way up north apparently. Um, and I also do a lot of statistical ecology work in Spanish. So I work with a lot of people in Latin America. So I do work in Spanish and English. Um, and the Greenland shark is a, an enormous shark. It's the size of a white shark, um, but they've attached accelerometers and there's people in Canada that work on the shark as well. Uh, it's, I think, one of like, the slowest fish relative to its size. Um, so it's very, very slow. It's a large shark, it's very slow, it's kind of lazy, um, and it lives under the ice. <laughs> And I've always thought it fascinating. They found like reindeer in it before, polar bear. Um, yeah, I think it's just like a big lazy shark. It's very calm, just chills under the ice. That is really cute. And, and as a follow-up, is that a species that you have any projects on or is that just a side interest uh, of, of ecological uh, consideration? Yeah, no, I haven't. I've identified who works on Greenland sharks here in Canada, but I still haven't formed a collaboration. Um, my current collaborations are on oceanic white tip sharks, leopard sharks, um, white sharks, finishing a project. Uh, I advise a student on a manta ray project. Uh, there's the, the fish that's endemic, the totoaba, um, and a variety of other shark species. Fabulous. So on that, on that kind of uh, enthusiastic note about one of the species that brought you to statistical ecology in the first place. Uh, I'd like to, to thank you for sharing your work with us, uh, engaging so generously in conversation. Um, and thanks to all of you who are, who are joining us from all over for this uh, seminar series. And we welcome you to join us again in two weeks uh, for our next one. As always, register on Eventbrite. If you're interested in following up with uh, Dr. Leos Barajas on uh, the Statistical Ecology Community in Progress. Uh, you can find all of our contact information on the School of the Environment website, uh, as well as in Statistical Sciences, and she just put her email address right back up on the screen. Uh, so thank you, and uh, for my graduate students, we'll take a 10-minute break and then reconvene. And for everyone else, thanks for joining.